Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. On the next Wyoming Chronicle, we visit with Wyoming author Kathy Ringler. Her first book, Maya's Dream, takes the issue of teenage bullying head on with a story about a young girl, her horse, and her decisions impacting her teen friends. It's a timely read for youth and adults alike. Also, we'll learn about Wyoming's Safe to Tell program, a critical tool for teens and families yearning to get help in Wyoming. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support. As we begin our discussion on bullying in Wyoming, we want to do it with a Wyoming author who has written just about that. Kathy Ringler, welcome so, um, to Wyoming Chronicle. We're so glad you're with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Kathy, I want to talk about your book, Maya's Dream, and I want to talk about you as a writer. Um, but certainly Maya's Dream is about bullying at its core. Um, tell me, why did you write this particular book at this particular time? Mm, that's a good question. Um, as you know, bullying is a huge issue in, in our lives. And I started thinking about my own experience. Um, I moved a lot growing up. And my mom and dad always, we had a close family, and my mom and dad always tried to kind of buffet some of those effects. But on this particular day in middle school, I would moved in the middle of the year, and I witnessed a bullying scene. And I was so taken aback that I didn't react and the bullying happened. And to this day, I regret that. Uh, it is in my book, and thank goodness my protagonist, Maya, um, is able to react much better than I ever did. This is, this is a wonderful read, and I, and I view it in the context, number one, I'm so happy my kids didn't grow up in the world of social media. And your book talks a lot about what growing up today in the world of social media is, out about, is about tough, Tough. You're right. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But this is a book to me that, even though it might be written for middle schoolers, young adults, this is a book maybe that families can read together. Absolutely. And it's been really gratifying to me. Um, a lot of parents and grandparents who bought the book have come back and said, I read the book before I gave it to my child, and now we're reading it together and talking about it. What do you think surprises parents the most when they read this book? Because even with someone who's into tech, Boy, it's got to be tough today. It is, and I think that they are amazed at how prevalent bullying is across all parts of the school. You know, there's the bullies, there's the victims, there's the victim bullies, which is actually the hardest group to deal with, and then there's the bystanders. So every single child in school is affected some way by bullying. In this book, there's um, Maya, the <laughs> central character who begins um, the book, she's also overweight. Mm -hmm. and, she and she has, personally, she has trouble dealing with that, um, certainly in the first part of the book. She's kind of, in my eyes, the first victim we meet, but then we also meet another victim, Abigail. Right, and Maya, I chose her because she is overweight, and she um, isn't the, on the lowest rung of the social ladder, but she could sure reach it with her tiptoes. And so for her to say, watch this event, this child being bullied on her first day, and say, that's wrong, and I need to do something about it. That makes a huge transformation um, during the book. But she struggles with what to do. She struggles. She spends a sleepless <clears throat> night trying to come up with the right plan. And then she, the book unfolds, she tries a lot of different things. Some work and some don't. There are others, there are adults involved in this book as well. Um, certainly um, a teacher who is wonderful, but then another teacher maybe that maybe not isn't as cued in, I guess I'll say. Right. And I would say, you know, from my experience as a teacher and all the teachers I and know. And you taught, let's talk about that right now. You've taught for a long time before you retired. That's right. I taught for 31 great years before I retired. And uh, 
spend a lot of emotional time with those kids. You know, teachers spend a lot of time and creative energy um, trying to think of what's the best practice. What's the best practice to teach someone who has some visual motor difficulties when they're learning to read? What's the best practice for a kid who has a math disability? Um, how can you help kids get along? So that took a lot of creative energy for 31 years. And then when I retired, I had the energy to, to start looking at the bullying issue and write a book to address that. Let's go talk about your history as a writer real quick. Okay. And then we'll get back to the teachers that, that are so critical. Okay. Um, yes, you are a writer, and you're a, a, an awarding, award winning writer. Um, you're a Wyoming Writer Award winner in 2016 and 2017. You've won other awards as well. What has motivated you to want to write? This was a short story first that you expanded. That's exactly right. Um, well, again, while I was teaching, I found that I was a much better teacher if. When my kids were writing, I was writing at home because I could be more empathetic, a better problem solver. And if you think about it, word choice, organization, structure, they're the same whether you're writing a story about the tooth fairy or whether you're writing an article for the reading teacher. So I practiced a lot while I was still teaching. And then when I retired, I wrote the short story for Wyoming Writers' Contest, and the judge wrote me the nicest little personal note. And she said, um, the characters are great. Why don't you turn this into a novel? Had you thought about that before? Nope, I sure wow. hadn't. So, following a very steep learning curve, I turned it into a novel and I pitched it to uh, Patricia Landy of Crystal Publishing out of Fort Collins. And she took it and ran with it and here we are. I guess my biggest challenge right now, um, as we were visiting about, is how do I get the book into the hands of the kids and the parents who really need it the most? Sure. Um, I'm hoping we can help because, as we, as we said earlier, this is an issue I think many p parents aren't well equipped to talk about other than, you know, you're not, you know, texting anything inappropriate, are you? No, no, no. Okay. And then maybe that's the last conversation they might even have. That's true. About that's true. The social media. Or and, you know, um, there have been a lot of research on bullying within the last 25 years, and they're finding that the assembly, you know, that Maya talks about, um, is, can be counterproductive. It was so interesting because these kids, we think, are given the tools. They, they go to the assemblies. They know that, that, you know, maybe parents are sitting at home going, well, my kid's been um, talked to about that. So I know that they're not bullying or they're not victims right. because they have assemblies all the time and these speakers come in. They got the pencil that says stand up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, <clears throat> a lot of times they say they're counterproductive because if a school checks that off, okay, I've taken care of it and not really worked on the root of the problem, that it just keeps expanding. But it expands in a place that's anonymous sometimes, mm -hmm. very private. Um, we were talking off, off camera when um, we were raising our kids. We had one computer, maybe with instant messenger, right. that was kind of in our family room. We certainly didn't have these little small devices in the bedroom at 3 in the morning. Exactly. That exactly. Is, is just a real worry for Or in the parents. kids' laps at school, yeah. In real time. What do you tell parents on how to talk to their, what do, what do you think about telling parents to well, talk to their kids about social media and the dangers of it? Oh, well, social media is kind of a, a different, a whole different ballgame, but if they look at the advice that Maya tries to work through in the book, I think there's some things that she does that are right. Um, for instance, she makes that decision and she comes up with a plan. And then when she has that plan, she says, okay, I'm going to talk to this kid and we're going to avoid the place where the bullying is happening. That's her first good thing. So she gets out of the cafeteria. When I first thought about that, I thought, oh, she's wussing out. Yeah. She doesn't want to go confront this head on, but it turned out to be a good strategy. Exactly, exactly. So she gets out of the cafeteria, she gets out of the place where the cool kids are the bullies, the aggressors, actually, and they go find that teacher. And we were talking about teachers. I think that of all the teachers I've known, the vast majority, 99%, if they know there's a problem, they're going to want to step in and help. And it's that 1% that um, Maya encounters in her book also. Mm -hmm. um, so she finds that teacher and has a safe place. So now they have a safe place, a safe, and a safe teacher. Those are the three first things that she does that are right. We're going to talk a little bit later in the program about why I mean safe to tell program. And that will give parents, I think, some other tools on at least where to start exactly. in, in dealing with this important issue. Um, it was fun to read this because this was 
Uh, this was a book set in Wyoming. Yes. With a Western flair. For <laughs> right, sure. we, exactly. We've got rodeo and we've got riding and we've got a horse and all of these things that I think will strike um, a, a, a good chord with many people. I think you're right um, because you know that's kind of how I you know grew up with and well after we finally settled in Wyoming my kids grew up and I was just comfortable writing about jackpots and rodeo and, and <clears> how <throat> that impacts kids another thing that Maya does right and her parents her parents keep trying to talk to her and my and Maya keeps just shutting them out you know she's embarrassed um, she's worried that they'll be worried about her and that they can't help her so why even bother? Even though they're loving even, parents. Right, they're loving parents and they're trying their best. Absolutely. Um, so, but they keep pushing her into getting involved in something else. And for Maya, it's the barrel racing and then later her art. I think it, if a kid, um, instead of coming home from school after a terrible day, getting that bag of chips, going to the room, locking their door and, and listening to their music, I think if they would push themselves to to have another interest. Maybe they can build a model rocket. Maybe they can shoot a bow and arrow. Maybe they can take great photographs. But something they can build an identity outside of just school or they might not be successful. Extracurricular activities and they do not have to be athletics. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Kids are so talented in so many different areas. Tell me about your writing day, Kathy. What do you like to do? Um, we, and I'll tell our viewers, we had a chance to meet your husband a couple years ago. He's a great leatherman. Um, and, and makes wonderful leather products, just a, a great chronicle that we had gotten to uh, shoot with him. So we know what his day's like. What's your day like? Well, um, I get up in the morning, work out, and then I try to sit down for <clears throat> after breakfast. And important, that's an important part of our day with Vaughn. I try to sit down for you know two to three hours of writing time. Um, I don't, a lot of writers, um, use words as a tool to measure. I don't, because that puts too much pressure on me. I try to like have a chapter a, a day. Right, exactly, or a thousand words. You know, I try to have a scene in mind before I quit about where I want to start the next day. And then I sit down and um, open up my veins and <laughs> try to get some words out on the yeah. paper. Some days it's harder than others. Um, Sometimes I'll take a walk in the middle of that um, mm -hmm. if I'm stuck, and it'll come to me, and I'll sit down and write some more. Um, I'm very, very fortunate to have grandkids close, so I watch them three days a week. Uh, uh, we're breaking a filly. Um, I volunteer a lot, <laughs> so there's lots of other things to do mm -hmm. after that writing time. Wonderful. I'll bet you you're not finished. Oh, no, absolutely. I'm working on a, a sequel to Maya's Dream. Um, if people read Maya's Dream, they'll meet Jake. Jake's the kid that she's known um, ever since she was two years time. old. Mm -hmm. He's the popular kid, he's the jock, but he's always there for Maya. And uh, he- Comes across real well in the book. He does come across yep. real well. He's got good values and he, he stands sure up for he her. Does. Yeah. yeah, so we'll look forward to that. Um, let's talk timelines. How long once the judge gave you the, um, the, the, the nice letter telling you that you should turn this into a novel, until today. How, how much time are we talking about? It was a steep learning curve and because I was learning I made a lot of mistakes. So um, I wrote the, the novel as linked short stories. But when I pitched them to Patricia the first time she said I can't sell linked short stories. We, um, if you could put this in a novel and keep incorporating the themes of body image and bullying I can sell this novel for you. So I had to go back and rewrite again. And um, every writer knows that you keep writing and rewriting and rewriting. Mm -hmm. I had a great- Is that hard for you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a great um, writing group, small but mighty, that helped me a lot. And of I course, family and friends. I a painter who puts the first coat on and needs to do a second coat and, and a third coat maybe. And, and then decides this isn't working at all. <laughs> Get some more paint. This is not my wife, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so um, after, after finally I gave it to Patricia, then she had her editors look through it. And the first one, and I worked real well together, some of the others I had a little harder time with. I don't have an agent, um, so I kind of on my own. And they really didn't understand horses and the horse vernacular. So, the, um, for instance, when you're in, when you go to a jackpot, you don't enter the jackpot; you enter up. Right. And they took out all the ups, or um, so they would have them just entering. Or in one of the scenes, uh, Maya goes to look at a horse, and the girl comes out to show her the horse, and she's pulling on pink muck boots. Well, they took out the muck, and they just had pink boots. Oh, interesting. So. A, that would be two different types of girls, pink boots versus pink muck boots. Right. So I had to keep going back and saying, no, 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 you have to leave that part alone. Well, Kathy, we want to give parents some good opportunity to learn about the Safe to Tell program. So we're going to venture there now, but I can't thank you enough 
for visiting with us today about your book, Maya's Dream. It's available not only at your website, from Barnes & Noble, from Amazon, from maybe some local independent bookstores. Right, and um, I hope that people enjoy it. I think that they will, and we'll look forward to your next offering as well. Thanks, Greg. Kathy, thank you for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. As we continue our discussion on bullying in Wyoming, we thought it would be very important to give parents, students, and others a tool to use to effectively help and help right away. And we're going to talk about now this, about Wyoming's Safe to Tell program. Bill Morris is, a, is the program's program manager. Bill, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you. And Samantha Kanish is Safe to Tell's public relations specialist. Samantha, welcome. Thank you. I think um, first I'd like to know a little bit about the history of what Safe to Tell, how it evolved because I think its roots are very interesting. Bill, do you want to start? Yeah, uh, Safe to Tell Wyoming uh, was created in 2016 after uh, the legislature approved a bill creating a school safety tip line. Um, and then from that, uh, we developed Safe to Tell Wyoming program. If you look at though our history, uh, we, we were able to copy what Colorado had done. Uh, they had put in place a tip line for students to use, it was confidential. I think theirs is anonymous, but it was put in place after the Columbine shooting because they realized that that people knew something was going to happen, but nobody shared that. They didn't feel safe, and so they created their program. When we were ready, they were gracious enough to help us get ours up and running and uh, provide much of the framework, uh, so to speak, that we use today. Samantha, so if I were to ask you, what is safe to tell Wyoming? What would you tell me? It is a 24-7, 365 school and student safety confidential tip line. So basically, all hours of the day, um, every day of the year, even holidays, this tool is available to students, parents, concerned community members, even teachers to utilize. So, Tell me how it works. Mm -hmm. what, how does the program work? Um, <clears throat> there's a phone number. We're showing that on our screen right now. There's a website. There's an app. There are many ways people can use this, but what would people expect if, you know, I know that my son or daughter is bullied. I've never thought that I could maybe tell someone anonymously or this way. So what would happen if somebody, you know, is using any of those three means that, you, that you've that you mentioned uh, to make a tip? What happens is, is that uh, it's really easy to use. Our web page and our mobile app are very easy for somebody to use if they're, if they're into that system. And once they complete the information that's requested, it is, is then sent when they hit the submit button on the software, it is sent to the Highway Patrol Dispatch Center here in Cheyenne. They then verify that you know the school that's been identified is correct and all of that based on, on what's in the narrative. Hopefully there's enough information provided that they can determine that. And then in just a few, matter of a few seconds, really, uh, they can then forward that uh, tip on to a predetermined school contact or contacts, most schools have multiple contacts, with just the push of a button. So it's very easy for them to push it on. And then most tips, uh, especially if they have a law enforcement tied to them, some criminal element is, is then faxed uh, to the law enforcement agency for that jurisdiction. But I don't think we can say <clears throat> enough that if, if we're in the Christmas vacation or if we're on a weekend and he just said this is going to a school official who may or may not be at school, there are people ready still right now. Is that correct, Samantha? That's correct. So with these <clears throat> predetermined teams, they can log in uh, through and access their email and or through their cell phone to access to the tip. And so they're able to do that as well. And it, of course, if there's the life safety issue um, and it's after school hours, law enforcement can get involved as well. Bill, why should I use Safe to Tell? I mean, we've, we've all heard that we should maybe talk to a trusted adult maybe a pastor, maybe a teacher, maybe a guidance counselor. Where is safe to tell really important? Where does it come into play? Well, and, and when we do our presentations in schools, that's what we tell kids is, is many of you may have that trusted adult, whoever that may be uh, in your school or in the community. Um, but many times students, some students don't have that trusted adult. And then there's many times that the students don't feel comfortable starting that conversation or they don't know how to start that conversation. Maybe it's something personal in nature other than bullying, maybe. And so they really don't, they struggle. And so we tell them if you, if you're, if you don't have that trusted adult or a place to go or you don't know how to start that conversation, start it with us. It's done confidentially. We don't know who you are and we'll get the information from you, especially if you're trying to get help for your friend. We'll get that information and get it sent out to that school team and, and get that process started to intervene and, and get some help to the person. 
Samantha, I can see, I can see these conversations right now mm -hmm. of, a, of a mom or dad visiting with their, with their teenage son or daughter, mm -hmm. saying, you really need to do something to help Mary, for example. I don't want to be a snitch. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get involved with that. They have a tool here, though, that allows them to maybe do the right thing. Yes, and, it, and we've even had parents encourage their students to utilize this. So um, it is, like Bill said, a way to encourage them that starting that conversation. And it's a safe environment because it is so important to break that code of silence to get these kids the help that they need, whether it's from the mental health uh, aspect of their lives or through bullying or drugs. This works in Cheyenne, but it also works in Kimmerer, in Cody, in Wright, in Newcastle. This is all over Wyoming, big town or small. Correct. Every community that has a school in it is already pre-identified in our web page and in our mobile app. So we have every community and every school loaded. Uh, we've even uh, have contacts for community colleges in our, in our program so that if somebody is communicating with somebody in college uh, and they're struggling, then we, we can identify that school and, and get, get some resources started to them. You mentioned earlier, Bill, that th this can be confidential, and it is confidential, but the information is recorded. What happens to the information? Well, the information is recorded in our software that we uh, get through a vendor. Uh, so it's a third-party vendor that we use. Um, and his program, and he's, and he's really worldwide, is based on that confidentiality. And so once it's recorded, we have a record of it. The school can access those tips that are assigned to them, um, and it just stays in our system. It's not a public record, so the media can't, uh, you know, ask for a copy of that tip that came in if they heard something was going on at a particular school because the statute has protected that. And so it's, it's truly uh, confidential. It's not shared, um, and, and we, keep, we keep those records. Uh, they're on this vendor server down in Texas. I think he's at and You know, it's a secure environment platform that he has it on, and so... Um, yeah, he's got, he's got stuff from so all So bottom line country. is um, parents and students can rest assured that their information can be anonymous and it's confidential and it's protected. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Samantha, what do we know about how people are using this system? What do your statistics tell you? So Safe to Tell was originally designed to prevent school violent attacks. And we have seen as the program has evolved that the mental health piece of these students' lives is really what they're struggling with. It's consistently been in our top five. Suicide threats, uh, depression, and self-harm. And of course, we see bullying, drugs, but as of this year, we've seen an explosion in vaping and jewels. So. Vaping and? And jeweling. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I consider that the same thing. Yes. I should say it's just vaping. Vaping. Yes. <clears throat> so numbers-wise, statewide, what do we know? Um, is this, is this program being used effectively by the people that it's meant to serve? Do we know? Uh, we believe that it is. Uh, Wyoming, prior to, to Safe to Tell, had a school violence prevention program called WeTip. It was in place for about 10 years, uh, and they had received a, a little over 100 tips in that 10-year period. And when you look at our numbers um, that we have for this, you know, through this year, so since we started in October of 2016 through, through last night, we've received 3,441 tips. So we've got a significant number of tips in uh, for our student, our student uh, population. And when we were before the legislature working with them to try to get something in place, they had asked us what we thought our expectations would be. And so we looked at Colorado's student count and they have about 900,000 students and we had 90,000. So we figured we'd get 10%. And at the time, you know, we were thinking, you know, we'd get 100 and some calls a year. Well, we've far exceeded that. Um, and the program just continues to grow. So if you look at suicide threats, as Samantha mentioned, we've, we've had 509 tips uh, since the start of the program on students that were expressing thoughts of suicide. Um, and then bullying is number two, and we've had 420 of those tips. So the students are using, or maybe the parents, um, and sometimes the parents will, will use that when, a, when somebody in elementary that maybe isn't uh, you know, good on a computer or a mobile app comes home, you know, a first grader talks about something in school, then you'll see a parent uh, maybe put that tip in. So they're using it all, all ages. Bottom line, <clears throat> if a parent or a student or a family friend or a grandpa or grandma has concerns, they shouldn't waste any time. This is a tool that's there for people right now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. How are schools trained 
in Safe to Tell? What, what, how, how do they know um, what it is the program can provide and how, they, how do they get that information to students? Well, when the program first started, I traveled the state and visited with every school district, uh, provided the <clears throat> district staff and the school staff, uh, you know, principals. Usually it was principals and above. Sometimes, depending on the school, you know, they might take it, you know, a little bit further down in the school, counselors and whatnot. And so we provided training to them on what the program is, what it could offer, uh, how to use the program. And then uh, after that, um, and, and including this year, you know, we talked about the travel before we started here. And, uh, we continue to reach out to schools. They've got new people in school. So we train their staff or we, we do presentations to the students themselves about the program and how it works. Is your message to folks, you know, and I don't know what your statistics are, like 90%, 80% of the calls are very real and need help help now. But even if the call turns out to be not necessary, it's better that parents or students have made the call. Would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. Absolutely, because the impact even... Um, not checking up and something does happen, the impact ripples throughout the community. So it's, you know, safe than sorry. You really should follow up because you don't know what state that person's in. And it's sometimes hard for them to communicate how real uh, or how in danger they are, especially mentally. So it's very important to follow up. And so we um, always, through our disposition feature in our reporting, follow up to just to make sure that something was, it was handled, the student was made, um, contact was made with the student, so. Samantha, it's a different world, and I'll give you the final word here mm -hmm. for parents who are raising kids in this era of social media. Yes, it's a very dangerous place. And just having, starting that conversation early before you give the kids the phone or access to social media, um, it, it can make all the difference so that they can hear the information straight from you before they hear it from a friend. And teach them how to be responsible online. What is appropriate? What's you know the impact of their blueprint with their lives on social media? It can have a lasting impact. And I think the bottom line message is don't be afraid to start that conversation. Correct. Yes. Samantha Canish and Bill Morris, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about Wyoming Safe to Tell program. Thank, thank you, you for, for having us. For having us, yes. Mm -hmm. Funding for this program is made possible in part by the Wyoming Humanities Council, helping Wyoming take a closer look at life through the humanities, thinkwhy.org, and by the members of the Wyoming PBS Foundation. Thank you for your support.